we're, we're finishing out this book that we've called Shemot, Names. And in here, let's not forget the, the, the purpose of what's going on here. Yahweh is revealing His character to His people. And He's expecting them to walk in His character and in His ways. So what does that look like for us? I mean, we're learning what it looks like when Yahweh says, I want to dwell among you. I want to dwell with you. I want to be in you. I want to have a place in your lives. I want us to have a relationship. Yahweh is showing us what that is going to look like. He made the tabernacle as a place so we could learn how to approach Him. To learn how He desires to to have this relationship, this back and forth communion with Him. And so if we don't take a look at these things, we're, we're missing what the Father really desires for us to learn. How to approach. How to be in relationship. How to dwell with Him. And understanding the importance of clean and clean and holy and common. Because if we don't understand these things, again, these are, te- these are testimonies of the character of the Most High. If we don't understand His character, then how can we say that we're walking in His character? So we need to know his character in order to walk in it. So we need to learn what he says is clean. We need to learn what he says is acceptable. We need to learn what he says is holy. We need to learn to approach him in ways that he says is good and right and is precious to him. Okay? So we've got a lot going on here. When we opened up with this parsha, uh, the people were in bondage. They were crying out. They've been redeemed, they've been delivered, they've been set free, they've been brought across the water, and, and here they're, they're, they're brought to a new place, they're in the wilderness now, they're learning from the Father, they, they've seen His presence, they've, they've, they've seen the cloud and the fire, and, and they're, they're seeing how to walk in the way of a future they are uncertain of. Have we ever been there? They're learning how to walk when they don't know what to expect. All they've ever known was how to be a slave in Egypt. They don't know how to live free or how to walk in paths of blessing, path of life, paths of righteousness. All they knew was how to be a slave in Egypt. And so the Father is here equipping them to take His presence with them wherever they go. And of course, even that's going to change, but not really. So we'll cover more of that a little later on here, okay? So now, they were given the the instructions. Yahweh told Moshe, these are the things I want you to do. When what was the very first thing he was told to build? Well, the very first thing he was given the instruction for was the ark. The ark representing the heart. And so the very first thing he he was given instruction was the heart. And so the heart, the, the tabernacle was built inside out. The instructions were given inside out. So the instructions were given. Then we find where they started building everything. Now, we have another account of all these things being done again. How many times is this thing going to be built? Once, to start. <laughs> Every time they move, they've got to take it down and put it back together. But there's truly one building of it. Because what happened, they were given the plan. Then they started building it. Now, they have to bring everything that was done and, and submit it to Moshe to be accountable to the work that they had done to make sure it was, it was the way that it was supposed to be so that it could be put together and used in its proper service. So now they're actually literally starting to put it together. And Moshe is overseeing all the items and the overseeing putting it all together. And then he's explaining to the people as we go, this is where this goes. This is how, how it sits. This is what happens here. All Israel was to know how this was a representation of Yah in their midst and how to approach. Okay? Thus, this name, Pikudei. Pikudei means to give an account. To give an account of something. Okay? This parsha we start off, it says, Ele Pikudei Hamishkan. And these are the accounts of the tabernacle. Now, the word account is uh, given in, in different places. It's given as some, the records, or whatever, but they all mean the same thing. This is an account, or you could even say an accountability of the things that were done for the Mishkan, for the tabernacle. Because Pico Dei is to give an account, but Pakad, the word that it's from, means 
to visit. Now, this is not like just uh, some leisurely, let's sit down and have tea kind of visit. Okay? This was a visit with a purpose. This was a visit to oversee something, to charge something, to do a judgment to something, to make sure that something is in, in its right place, in its right order. This is an accountability thing. Okay? So this is a personal visitation to make sure that everything that was here was as it should be. And it is ready and prepared to be put into the service that it was created for. Okay? Are you starting to see the picture now? of How the Father is desiring to do things in us. See, we come to Him in the state that we are. But yet, to be a real intimate with Him, we know He has to change us. It's not us changing us, it's Him changing us. We have to submit ourselves to be changed. But He will change us. And He will cleanse us. And He will bring us into His presence. Okay? Now, the very first time this word pakad is used is given to Sarah. The very first time this word pakad is used is, to, is Sarah. It says, the Yahweh pakad et Sarah. And Yahweh visited Sarah. So when he visited her, what was this purpose? Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son, right? So he, he, he came here to examine, to say, Sarah, <laughs> you laughed. Guess what? The time is now, uh, now at hand to do what I had told you was going to happen. You will bear a son. So this is, again, an account or an accountability a visitation with a purpose that is going on here. Okay? So again, with the Mishkan, with the tabernacle, we're giving an account of everything that's coming ahead so that we can learn how to approach, how to dwell, how to have relationship. Okay? So there is a day we will all have to give account of the things that Yahweh has given us. Will that be a joyous occasion or will that be a grievous occasion? When we give an account for everything that the Father has entrusted us with, will we have used what He has given us for His kingdom or will we use it to build our own kingdom? You know, time, money, resources, talents, everything you are, are you using it to build His kingdom or are you using it to build your own? One day, we will all have to stand before the Father and we will all have to give an account of everything that He has given us a plan for have we followed the plan. And we, if we start to see these things, if we go and we examine, like the Mishkan, go and examine the tabernacle to say, this is the plan of how I want to dwell. This is the plan for relationship. Will we walk in it? He, I mean, even for the tabernacle, he gave them the silver and the gold and the precious stones and all the things that they would need to build it. What if they decided they wanted to keep these things to decorate their own tent? See, it's a matter of using what the Father has given us for Him, for His kingdom. It doesn't mean you can't have anything. It means, is our goal and our life and our purpose, our desire, our passion, to see His kingdom here on earth? And that's going to change how we do things. That's going to change how we live. That's going to change what we see as important. Right? Right? You work a job because you have to. Is that your passion? See, you, you do it because you got to live, but our passion should be seeing his kingdom in our midst. And we, need, we have a role to play in that. And that is what the Father has given us. I mean, he's given you, your very breath is saying he's given you something for him. So use your breath for him. The very fact that he's given you life is he has given you something. Use your life for him. If he's given you talents, use them for him. You know? And be careful in, in, in everything that we make sure we give credit where credit is due. It belongs to Yah. Okay? Not saying you can't receive a compliment, okay? But saying make sure that we're giving God the glory for everything. God doesn't share his glory with anyone. All right? We'll get back to that in a minute. Matthew 12, 35. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for, check this out, 
Not just their actions, but every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. So it's not just actions that matter. It's your words that matter as well. Sometimes the words cut uh, cut and hurt worse than the actions. We have to be careful of the things that we say. Because there are some people who would much rather just say, you know what, just hit me, just don't, you know, speak to me like that. Why? Because that hurts worse. How many people, how many adults are still dealing with wounds of words from when they were children? See, we need to be careful of the words that we speak. We need to make sure that our words are life and that our words are showing the heart of the Father. We can build people up with our words or we can tear people down with our words. So we need to make sure we're building the kingdom. Yes, doing it physically and literally and working in our communities and doing things, but we need to make sure we're speaking the right things as well because out of, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Okay? Romans 14, 7 through 12. For none of us lives only in relation to himself, and none of us dies in relation, uh, only in relation to himself. In, in other words, your actions don't just affect you. Keep that in mind. You know, people say, hey, I'm going to do this, and, and it's, if they don't like it, it's their problem. If you're throwing stumbling blocks purposely in front of people, know that's your problem. Now, granted, you can't just live your life and saying, you know, well, if, if they do this or that, then that, you know, because you're never going to please everybody. Someone will always find a, find a way to be offended at something you do or say. Get, trust me, they're out there. Anything you say or do, someone will be upset. Okay, so there's no winning this. Honestly, there's no winning it. But we need to be careful of our attitude and actions toward that. Are we purposely throwing things out and saying, I don't care, or do we care? We say, you know, I'm not going to do things that I know is going to hurt someone else. Right? Um, So where was I at with that? Still verse 7. Verse 8, so if we live, we live in relation to the Lord, and if we die, we die in relation to the Lord. So whether we live or we die, we belong to the Lord. Indeed, it was for this very reason that the Messiah died and came back to life, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Verse 10, you then, why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For all of us will stand before God's judgment seat. When we all stand before the Father, (laughs) we can't point the finger at anyone else. When we all stand before him, it's just us and him. And, they're, and, they're, and we can't say, yeah, but my mom and dad, we will all have to give an account for our own actions and our own heart. And so there's no pointing fingers here. We have to be accountable for our actions. So since it is written in the Tanakh, as I live, says Adonai, every knee will bend before me and every tongue will publicly acknowledge God. So then every one of us will have to give an account of himself to Yah. Back to Exodus chapter 40, verses 1 and 2. So Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, On the first day of the month you shall erect the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. On the first day of the first month? What month is that? Aviv, the month of Nisan. What month did they come out of Egypt? Aviv, Nisan. Okay, so here they are celebrating an anniversary of their redemption and their deliverance by preparing a place for Yah to dwell. How relevant? How how precious is that? So what we find here, is there significance to Rosh Kodesh? You will will put up the tabernacle on Rosh Kodesh. Is there significance to that? Exodus 12, Yahweh spoke to Moshe and Aaron in Egypt, and he said, this month shall be for you the what? The beginning of the month. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Their coming out of Egypt and their redemption of coming out of Egypt was so big of a deal that Yahweh says you are to institute the calendar in which your life is lived from this point forward from right here. Your redemption is such a big change that that you even follow a different timetable. Think about that for a minute. The religious calendar, the Hebrew calendar in the Bible doesn't start in January. Then the reckoning of the Moedim and, uh, and, 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 and the times and the seasons, all these things that are given, you start from Aviv, the month of Nisan. 
which is always in the springtime. So this is the head of the beginning of all the months. There is a big change here. There's a, there's a big change in, in our life, so big that Yah is saying, even the way you see time itself from this point forward is going to be different. Now check this out. We're talking about redemption, Rosh Chodesh, and remembrance. We are told to observe the times and the seasons the Father has established. Well, how do we know what the months are if we don't acknowledge the months as they're passing? Make sense? If we're not counting the times, if we're not looking at these times, how do we know what time we're in? Right? So, each Rosh Chodesh, we are given the opportunity to remember to build a place for Yah to dwell. Think about that. Each Rosh Chodesh, we are given the opportunity to say, I, this month I will prepare my household, myself, to, to show the presence of Yah in our midst. And as each Rosh Chodesh is coming in, and we're, we're coming out of one month and entering into a new one, many consider it what they would call a Yom Kippur Kitan. Okay, well, Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement, but what do you do on Yom Kippur? Okay, of course, you, you examine yourself. You see where you stand. You see where you've maybe missed it, things where you have, have done okay, things where you can do better. I mean, you examine yourself. What they encourage is that each month, we take the time to examine ourselves and say, in this month that just passed, did I glorify the Father? Did I honor Him? Did, did my household glorify and honor Him? And then resolve within ourselves that in this month that is coming, we will do that. Each month we're given the opportunity to say, I will create a place for Yah to dwell in this month in my life. Now granted, we should be doing that every day. But, do we really? Okay? A lot of people don't. Granted, a lot of people do. That's awesome. A lot of people don't. And so, we need reminders. You know why we need reminders? We forget. <laughs> If we don't have something constantly in front of us, we forget. And so we have reminders that are given in the Word to remind us of the things that are important. Because if we're not reminded of the things that are important, the things of God, we will forget these things in, in, the, uh, in, in the pursuit of the things that are constantly pulling at us and distracting us. Like, you need to work your job, but do you really need to work your job 100 hours a week? When your wife and your kids are at home and they don't even know who you are? You know, these type of things, okay? We need to make sure we keep in mind and remember what's important. Isaiah 66, we'll start verse 1 and 2, and then we'll go jump a little further down. So, thus says Yahweh, heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? Again, we're talking about a place for him to dwell and building a house, building a habitation for him, right? And then later on in this chapter, he goes and talks about Rosh Chodesh and Shabbat. How do we build a place for him to dwell? In the time and the space and the place that he said to. Right? Let's keep going. So what is the house that you would build for me and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these things came to be, declares Yahweh. But this is the one to whom I will look. One, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. That's how we prepare a place for him to dwell. Right? But let's jump further down. Let's go to verse uh, 20. And I shall bring all your brothers from the nations as an offering to Yahweh, on horses and in chariots and in litters, and on mules and on dromedaries, and to my holy mountain, Jerusalem, says Yahweh, just as Israelites bring their grain offering in the clean vessel to the house of Yahweh. And some of them I will also take for priests and for Levites, says Yahweh. Look at verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth that I, that I make shall remain before me, says Yahweh, so shall your offspring and your name remain. So we're talking the new heavens and the new earth. And so this isn't a time that is yet to be. We're not there yet. Because if this is the new heavens and new earth, we got problems. Okay? So we're talking in a time that is yet to be. And what does he say in verse 23? From new moon to new moon, from Shabbat to Shabbat, all flesh will what? Come to worship me, declares Yahweh. And so if these things are, are what Yahweh had declared for his people in the Torah, and these things are what Yahweh declares for his people in a time that is yet to be, who are we to say they're not relevant now? 
And it's not just Shabbat he's talking about. It's not Shabbat and all the Moedim. It's Shabbat and Rosh Chodesh. So, you know, we, we, we learn and we see the importance of gathering for Shabbat, but we don't care about Rosh Chodesh. But yet, this is the part of examining and acknowledging the times and the seasons that the Father is telling us to keep our eyes on. It's important. So in Shemot, in Exodus, Yahweh reveals his character not just to Israel, but to the world. Then he say that I'm doing these things not just for you, but so that the world will know, so that all the Egyptians will know. He said, I'm going to make a distinction between you and between the people that belong to him and the people that don't belong to him, between Israel and between Egypt, between Israel and the rest of the world. The whole world heard about what Yah did in Egypt. But how many, how many went to follow him? Yeah, it scared them. Scared them enough to where they've actually repented? Fear doesn't lead to repentance. Fear is just a way for people to seek to get out of the consequences of what brought the fear. Make sense? Did I, did I lose you on that? Did I say that okay? If people are scared of something, all they want is what's causing them to be scared to stop. It doesn't mean their heart is for what's going on. Scripture says it's his kindness that leads to repentance. But his judgments were made known so that all the world will know <laughs> he is God. He crushed all the other deities. So it's only a small portion of the people who are willing to receive covenant with Yah. It was Israel who came out, and there were some that came out among them, but not that much, you know. There is even a smaller portion of those who are willing to live closely with him. And there's an even smaller portion of those willing to see his character and his glory. You have Israel camped out here, and you have the Levites, and the Kohen, and Aaron, and Moses. The closer you get to the most holy thing, the more responsibility you have, the more accountability you have, and that's what scares us. But that's what we need to be aware of. Because if Yahweh has said, I've called you to be a holy people, then we all bear that responsibility. Exodus 33, 18, Moshe said, show me your glory. Moshe wanted to intimately know Yahweh. He, he, he said, show me your glory. Moshe was up on the mountain, but notice up on the mountain, he never saw his face. Even when he said, show me your face, and Yahweh put him in the cleft of the rock and he walked by, did he see his face? No. He didn't see fully who Yahweh was. Picture that. Moshe did not fully see who Yahweh was. And, and Moshe saw more of Yahweh than anyone else. Exodus 40:34. We find in the Mishkan that the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of Yahweh filled the Mishkan. Was this an automatic thing? Was this something that just happened? Or did the people have to make a preparation for this to happen? Yahweh said, I want you to build me a tabernacle. He gave the specific instructions. What if they would have built the things and, and, and put things together and it's like, hey, this joint right here is supposed to be 90 degrees and it's at 75. That's yeah, good enough. Really? Would God inhabit a place that's good enough? Or will he inhabit a place that is as he wanted it? See, we have to be willing to prepare the place as he has set. Okay? And then, a lot of times throughout the scripture, we see the glory in relationship with the cloud. Why would the cloud show with the glory? Because I believe he is a consuming fire, and I believe it was the fire that created the cloud. <laughs> and then the cloud is what's keeping us from seeing him, which is what's keeping us alive. <laughs> we see the cloud as, as an acknowledgement that his presence is there. But we don't see his presence. You know why? Because if we saw his presence, we would make idols that looked like him. Why? Because that's what man does. And we would take that spot and build a church right there. Now, keep in mind, when I say that we have to build the tabernacle, we have to prepare a place for him to dwell, I am in no way, shape, or form saying that we are forsaking covenant or we are forsaking relationship in, in, in lieu of a, we have to do it, and we got to get it right, and we got to, because that's fear too. The Father does desire relationship more than anything else. He wants your heart more than anything else. But we should have that desire to get it right, but yet 
if we're so scared of getting it right that it paralyzes us from moving closer to Him, we've let fear take us over. We have to follow His direction, but we can't walk in fear. Okay? Because perfect love casts out fear. So if we're following his, 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 his instructions and we are walking in his presence and his love, guys, this is where atonement comes in handy. As long as we're not blatantly doing something he said don't do, we should be okay. You know? So again, we're talking about covenant, but asking to see his glory is something else. We can be in covenant and we need to seek to follow Yah's desires. But if we've missed his heart, check this out, we won't be truly walking in his presence. Psalm 103.7 says, He made known his ways to Moshe and his acts to the people of Israel. Moshe knew his ways. Israel saw what God did. Which one would you rather be? Because Moshe saw what God did too. But Moshe knew God's ways. Israel saw God's deeds. Are we seeking the Father to try to see what we can get from Him and try to get Him to do for us? Well, I know God does this, so that's what I'm looking for. Or do we just want that relationship with Him? Knowing that in relationship with Him, He'll take care of the rest, but we just want that relationship with Him. See, And that should be our heart's desire. But in order to have relationship with Him, we do have responsibility. In other words... So you want to come closer to Yahweh, great. That thing right there, you need to repent. That's how we prepare a place for Him to dwell. We, 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 build, we build up, we do the things that encourage the, the dwelling with Him, but we remove the things that hinder it. See, We, pre- we prepare a place. So again, we're not trying to earn anything. We do not follow Yah's instruction to try to get anything from him or try to earn anything from him or to get in his good graces. We've got to do it right. We don't do the things that the Torah says to try to get anything, but yet because we are redeemed, we do what he says. We are obedient because we are sons. We don't do stuff to try to be a son. Okay? But yet because we are a son, we do. So, we don't follow any works-based salvation, works-based gospel. But if we are truly redeemed, we will seek to be obedient. James. Yeah, the whole book. (laughs) Pretty much, right? But we have here James 2, 17 and 18 says, so faith by itself, if it doesn't have works, it's dead. Faith without works is dead. So he says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. We show that we have faith because there is an action to our life that lines up in obedience to what the Father said. Read Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, so-and-so did this. The whole chapter. All different people. So we show our faith by our actions. And our heart is shown by the things that we do. Preparing a sanctuary. We are showing our fortitude and realizing that the Creator desires to dwell within us. At the sea, when they crossed the sea, they burst out into song. Right? Well, in this song, it says, Yah is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. I will prepare Him a habitation. Guys, before Yahweh even said, I want you to build me a tabernacle, the people declared this is what they wanted to do anyway. <laughs> they wanted to prepare a place for him to dwell. And the word that's there is, is the word nava. The root of the word is nava, which means to rest, like rest at home, a habitation, a place of rest. And then in Exodus 15, 17, it says, You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain, which is your heritage, the place, Adonai, that you made your abode, the sanctuary which your hands have established. Bring them to the mountain and, and plant the people in the sanctuary that he has established. What is the sanctuary that Yah established? You can, you can have an argument to say it's at Sinai. You can have an argument to say it's the tabernacle. Or you can say the place he is establishing is within you. He wants to be in your heart, but he wants you to be in his. So the Mishkan had to be prepared. 
They couldn't just build it all together, throw it all in one lump right in the middle of the, uh, of, of the camp and say, well, there it is. It had to be assembled. See, and much like us. We can, we can all have and be what we're supposed to be. We can all be together, but if we're not doing what the Father had said to do and being assembled and put together in the right way, we're useless. We're not fulfilling our call. When everything starts to be put together in its proper order, in its proper place, it becomes a wonderful place for the presence of Yah to dwell. Much like us. So, the Mishkan had to be prepared, and it had to be prepared according to the pattern. It couldn't be, well, this is how we're going to get it, and this is how we're going to put it all together, just as Moshe said, and Bezalel and Aholiab, the ones who were the foremen, you know, overseeing this whole project, and there's always some guy back there standing, well, shouldn't we be doing this this way and that way? And it'd be a lot better if we could just get... You know what i do to that guy? Here's the thing. It's not his vision. It had to be done the way that Yah showed Moshe. I don't care if you got a better way. You're not the one that was put in charge. <laughs> Let me put it in a little more pastoral way. There was one person who was anointed to see the task done. Moshe. And it all had to be done according to the pattern that was shown. Everyone else that worked in assembling the tabernacle and putting it together and even in the building it, they had to be humble. They had to be teachable. They had to be true, a true Talmi. They had to be a student. They had to learn. And Yahweh said that he will fill them with his spirit. He will give them wisdom. He, will, he taught them how to do all the things that they had to do. So a lot of things that we learn is we got to get out of the way so that God's glory can be in our midst. And understand that when God wants to do something and it's done, there's no way absolutely we can stand back and go, wow, look what I did. Think about it, guys. You guys who do construction, I know I've done it, right? I, I had my share in construction work. When you go and you drive by somewhere and you're like, I did that. <laughs> you do it, don't you? You know, it's kind of weird because and, and, and I also buried uh, cable. They're like, yeah, I buried that guy. Buried that guy. <laughs> okay, let me rephrase that. <laughs> I buried his cable, <laughs> his 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 fiber optic telephone line. Okay, so <laughs> so so these these are the things that we need to make sure. There's absolutely no way we can look back and say I did that. But at the same time, we can look and say, but I had a role in that being in our midst. See, we can't, take, we can't take praise for it, we can't take glory for it, but we can say, but we took part in it. See? Isaiah 42, 6 through 8. I, Yahweh, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them, and you will be a light to guide the nations. You will open the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in the dark dungeons. I am Yahweh. That is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor share my praise with carved idols. Yahweh will not share his glory with anyone else. And we think, you know, it's like if it, it, we get excited when we do something and it turns out well and Yah gets the glory, right? I mean, we get excited for that, right? We should. And it, and it is exciting. But be careful in our excitement that we don't take any of the glory that belongs to him. Exodus 40, 16. So Moses did according to all that Yahweh commanded him, so he did. In the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, the tabernacle was erected. And he erected the court around the tabernacle and the altar and set up the screen at the gate of the court. So who finished the work? Who? Moses finished the work. <laughs> If you had worked on this job for at least six months, you worked hard, your, your hands are the ones that got smashed with a hammer, you, you, you bled, you sweated, you worked, you dropped stuff on your feet, you put stuff on, you did all this, and then you come down to it, Moses makes sure it's all done, and he stands back, and you hear, and Moses finished the work, you'd be like, but... All he did was stand over there and say, you're doing it wrong. What are you talking about? 
Here's the question, and here's the test of faith as well. And this is where we find out if we're truly humble or not. How do you feel if somebody else gets the credit for something you had a part in? Are you willing to share, share that glory? Or do you want the credit? That's where it gets real, doesn't it? All praise, all glory, all credit goes to Yah. And if he created Moshe for that task, when that task is done, Moshe is the one that gets the credit. That's the way it is. And God gets the glory for it all. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will come to me, saying, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do many mighty works in your name? And to them I will declare, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Notice he didn't say anything wrong with the works. He said their heart was wrong. He said their heart was wrong. Uh, so we could speculate. It could be many different reasons why their heart was wrong. But the point is they were doing things that were good, but they missed the heart of it. You've got to be careful about that. So the work or the doing of faith is important. But if we do so outside of relationship, check it out, if we do so outside of relationship, desiring to walk hand in hand with the king and his kingdom, we've missed it. The building of the Mishkan was a labor of love, not a do it or else thing. This was a labor of love. Either you desired to see it here, you desired to see it in our midst, and you would, you want, you would do anything that you could to see it come to pass. If you want something bad enough, will you do anything you can to see it happen? So the question comes down to this. Do we truly want the presence of God in our midst? Do we truly want to see his kingdom here? Or is it too inconvenient? We're too busy doing other things. We're too busy building our homes to see his presence and his kingdom being built here. Hmm. We all need that Isaiah moment, guys. Isaiah 6, 3 through 5. One called to another and they said, Kadosh, 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 Yahweh Tzavaot, Maloko Ha'eretz Kavodo. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh Tzavaot. The whole earth is full of His glory. Are we there yet? His presence is everywhere. His glory is everywhere. But is it truly manifest and revealed here in the earth all over? No. This is what we're waiting for. When Isaiah truly saw the presence of Yah, he stopped pointing the finger at everybody else. You know, woe to this group, woe to that group, woe to those guys over there. No, he said, woe is me. Because when he got before the Father, it was just him and Yah. And he cried out. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. And then Yah said, he, he took the coal and, and, and the angel came and he cleansed him. And then Yahweh made a declaration. And he said, he heard the voice and he said, who will I send and who will go for us? And he said, Hineni shalachini. Here am I. Send me. It no longer became relevant that nobody else wanted to go. It no longer became relevant that there were others that were not doing what they were supposed to. When it, when it got down to that position where Isaiah was before the Father, he said, I will do whatever you want me to do. And like many of the other prophets, Yahweh said, I want you to go. I want you to proclaim my word. They will ignore you. They'll see you, but they won't see you. They'll hear you, but they won't hear you. But go tell them anyway. Hmm. So once we are redeemed, the question is, will we submit ourselves to be shepherded? Once we are redeemed, will we truly be a Talmud? Because didn't the scripture say, go and make disciples? It didn't say go and make converts. It said go and make disciples. A disciple is a student, and a student has to have a teacher. And a student is one who submits themselves constantly to, to learn and to change and to be corrected. Yeshua says, you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. So how do we prepare a place for Yah to dwell? John 15 has a good, has a good way to put it as well. John 15 Yeshua says, uh, uh, verse 4, Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Verse 8. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. How do we bear fruit? If you plant a tree and leave it alone, eventually it'll bear some fruit, but if it never gets pruned, it's not going to last that long. I mean, it's not going to continue very well. You want a tree, a tree to produce really good fruit, you prune it. Right? So we need pruned from time to time. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. So how do we do this? How do we do this abiding? How do we show this love? How do we do all these things? Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Notice he says, abide in my love, keep my commandments so that your joy may be full. If walking in the, in the word of the living God is not a joy to you, you got a heart problem. Maybe even a rebellion problem. Because walking in his ways should be a joy. It's not hard. It's not burdensome. Is it burdensome to walk hand in hand with the one who loves you so much that he laid his life down for you? No, say, but we're, he's walking this path and we're like, that's shiny. I want to go over there. <laughs> Yah will not dwell in a, in a divided house. Think about this. Yah will not dwell in a divided house. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For, and, and we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and will walk among them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, Go out from their midst, separate from them, says Yahweh. Touch no unclean thing, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you. You shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Notice he says, don't touch the unclean thing. He's quoting from the prophets, guys. <laughs> He's saying, don't have communion with these things of idolatry. Don't touch the unclean things, and, and, and Yahweh continue to walk in his ways. Matthew 12, 25. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. How can the kingdom of God be built up if we're constantly fighting each other? God doesn't need us to do anything, but yet he chooses us to do things he desires. Could it possibly be that we could see his return quicker if we just got along? And built his kingdom. Psalm 133 says, Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers to dwell in unity. Matthew 18, 19. So again, I say to you, if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them and my Father which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, in my character, in my life, and the things that line up with his word, right? There I am in the midst of them. So if we're gathering together in his life, in his name, in his character, in his everything he's given us, then he's there. But if we're getting together and we have contention and strife and discord and we can't get along, is he there? No, because we're not together in his name. We got to plug in. <laughs> you got to plug in. I got, a, I, I got a short story I want to share with you guys, and hopefully you'll find the same humor in it that I did. And yeah, it involves you too, Stuart, and, and uh, I, I think you'll be okay with me telling the story. <laughs> He's looking at me like, what are you doing? So, the air conditioner in my truck didn't work. And I live in Florida. You know? I mean, right now, it's not that bad. You know, it's a little cool out. and kind of rainy all day, but it's kind of cool out. But it's Florida. It gets hot. You know? which I can tolerate it for a while, you know, but then when faith gets in the truck, you know, it could be nice to have some air, you know. So my air needed fixed. I didn't have a lot of money to fix said air conditioner in the truck, okay? So let's try to see what we can do, try to see what we can get into and uh, what can be done. We think we know what the problem is, 
uh, just from the way it's acting, the way it's doing things. We think we know what the problem is. We get down there. I drive down to Stewart's, get up under, get up under the, 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 the car spot and pop the hood, get the tools that we need together. And we're, we're looking inside, and we're both like up over the top and the side, feet dangling, you know, out the edge and stuff, looking over and trying to work upside down and, and uh, trying to, try to pull this fan that blows in, into the air. And so we're looking at this, this shroud that holds this fan, and, and, uh, and Stu's like, hey, David, yeah, got a wire loose down here. Now, you couldn't see it from where anywhere else that it was loose. But once you got down there and once you got looking at it, wire's loose. And it was still sitting at some point, still sitting in the shroud. You pull it and yeah, it wasn't connected. It was just sitting right there. The way it was sitting, it, it looked like it was there, but it wasn't connected. Well, how do we fix it? Made the connection a little tighter. Closed the gap a little bit. Plugged it in, and it worked. On the way home, I pull out, I'm driving home, I'm like, God, thank you, because this is just a repair bill I just really didn't want to face, you know? And uh, I'm a firm believer that God uses humor, and I believe he's our Heavenly Father, so God will use dad jokes. <laughs> tells me, you know, we need to be plugged in like that. If we're not plugged in, you may get to where you need to be. You may get to your destination. But when you're going through the trials of life and you're driving, you know, you're going through life and you're stopping your traffic and, and you're going through the different uh, potholes and, and things that are going on, it's going to get hot. And you might lose your cool. You might get where you need to be, but you're not going to like it. And once you get there, you're going to look a mess. And smell. <laughs> but if we plug in, it makes the journey a lot more bearable. Hallelujah. Now the interesting thing, what caused it to happen? When you put a group of wires together, they put them through what, like a snake. It's just this plastic thing that keeps all the wires together. There's a button on that, on that snake that, that has this little pin at the back of it, pop it into the frame. It popped out. So the weight of the wires, the weight that it was trying to bear, pulled it loose from its connection. So... If we are trying to bear our own burdens, it's possible we could unplug. But if we have our support to hold in place as it should be, we will remain plugged in, and though life gets hard and it gets hot, we'll maintain our cool. And we'll still get where we need to be. Kind of, kind of crazy, right? I laughed. I, I did. I'm like, you're kidding me, right? You know? But that's what I got. And God will use any circumstance to show us what he desires for us. The point, you've got to get plugged in. You've got to get plugged in. Exodus 40, 34. So then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the glory of Yah was veiled in a cloud. We saw the cloud, we saw the fire, but we didn't see any form. Okay? For God is a consuming fire. But yet we didn't see the form of the fire. We just saw the fire and we saw the cloud, right? Deuteronomy 4.12. So then Yahweh spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of words but saw no form. We didn't see what he looked like. There was, on, there was only the voice. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. It is the Ten Commandments, and he wrote them on the two tablets of stone. And Yahweh commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and rules that you might do them in the land you are going to possess. Therefore... Watch yourselves carefully, since you saw no form on the day that Yahweh spoke you a horror out of the midst of the fire. Sometimes we get so caught up on what we need to see. I mean, think about this. God, I know that you said you were here with me, but I don't see it. Why do we say things like that? I mean, how many of us have said something like that? Maybe not exactly that, but something like that. You know why? 
because sometimes we need to see something as evidence in front of us to make sure that things are going the way that we think it should, and that's the problem. We put God in our box of this is how things are supposed to be. And God never said, I gave you that box to say how I'm going to do stuff. Okay, we need to make sure we're following him and let him do as he said he would. Okay, Isaiah 40, 1 through 5, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Yerushalayim and cry to her that the warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, and she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight the, in the desert a highway of our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, every mountain and hill made low, the uneven ground shall become level and the rough places plain. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed, and check this out, all what? Flesh, all flesh. Flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. There is a day when everyone will see the glory of God. Not just the fire, not just the cloud, not the mountain, but the glory of God. See his presence. Hmm. Waiting for that day. Exodus 24, 16 through 18. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. On the seventh day, he called to Moshe out of the midst of the cloud. And the appearance of the, of the glory of Yahweh was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. And Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. The people knew that the glory of God was there because of the fire and the cloud, but they didn't see him. Moshe went up and experienced Yahweh, but he still didn't see his glory. But just being in, in proximity of him, it changed him. Exodus 40, 35. So here, the glory of Yahweh comes down, hits that tabernacle, fills it it's so much and so strong to a degree that not even Moshe can go in and around. Moshe was on Sinai, but here, Moshe can't even go in here because Yahweh was dwelling in the most holy place. Hmm. Essentially, going into the throne room of the Most High. Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it and the glory of Yahweh filled the tabernacle. Throughout all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up over the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not set out till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of Yahweh was on the tabernacle by day, fire in it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout their journeys. I believe that this was one and the same, guys. The fire and the cloud were always there, but they saw it as a cloud during the day and fire at night. Because at night, you can see the fire more of it more prevalent, right? In the cloud, in, in the day, the cloud is covering up the fire, but at night, you can see the fire. I believe it was one of the same, not like, okay, shift change, cloud goes away, fire come, you know, all right? I think of that, more than Ralph, more than Sam. <laughs> so, Yahweh's glory was also dual in nature. This is from uh, Zondervan's Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary, okay? So, Yahweh's glory was also dual in nature, bringing reassurance to some terror to some, and probably equal, po equal parts of both to most. This recalls Moses' close encounter with Yahweh in Exodus 34 when Moses asked to see his glory. When he has granted this request, Yahweh descends, stands before him, and proclaims both his love and loyalty and his willingness to punish. To punish. <laughs> he declares his love and his loyalty and I will also judge. Okay, Understand the presence of Yah is an amazing, a wonderful, a, a loving, and a tender thing. It's also a, a terror, a terror <laughs> in our midst. It all depends. What, what makes the difference? And how you approach. <coughs> Throughout the Exodus narrative, Moses himself had experienced both aspects of Yahweh's presence, the providential deliverance of Israel, and yet an angry Yahweh threatening to annihilate his people. I'll just kill them all and start over with you, Moses. So it is this glory as both cloud and fire that as Exodus comes to a close is always in the sight of the house of Israel, ever reminding them of God's presence and their covenantal obligation to obey him. We need reminders. The Mishkan was supposed to stand as a reminder that Yah will be, be with us wherever we go. But there's a time coming when that changes. Because once they go into the land and they scatter into their, their, their respective territories, they can't see the tabernacle in their camp anymore. They're going to have to trust and have faith that Yahweh is still with them, even though they can't say, yep, the tabernacle's right there. When they go into the land, the manna stops. 
They're going to have to have faith in Yahweh that, yeah, go out my side of my tent and get the manna every morning. No, now I've got to tend the field. Life changes, God doesn't. So they have to have faith even in the midst of the changes that God is still with them. So we need to be careful that we understand that God is still with us even though life doesn't look the way that we think it should. Think about this. When God redeems you, does he say that you continue to live the, your life the way that got you into this mess? Or did he say, like he has said many other times before, go and sin no more? That's a change of life, isn't it? Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from all evil conscience and our bodies uh, washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who was promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting the meat together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We need to encourage one another, and we need to gather together for his purpose, for his glory, and to see his kingdom here in our midst. Amen? All right. Join with me. Hazak, Hazak, Veni Hazak. Be strong, be strong, and may we be strengthened. Amen. Amen. Yeah.